Hello everyone. Welcome to Storytelling Pitch Prep. This Eastern Kinna session will help build your skill in storytelling and your skills in communicating value to potential clients, customers, and investors. One of your instructors today is John Lamb. John Lamb is the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Specialist for the City of Mississauga's Economic Development Office, and more specifically, for the Mississauga Business Entrepreneur Center. His role involves supporting innovative scale-up companies in Mississauga or those who wish to locate in Mississauga. His entrepreneurial experiences stem from starting two ventures, one promoting physical activity to youth through Ultimate Frisbee workshops, and another connecting people to mental health resources through chatbot technology. John has also taught entrepreneurship courses as a teaching faculty member at Wilfred Laurier University and led startup incubators at the University of Guelph, Wilfred Laurier University, and Sheridan College. He studied recreation, business, and psychology in undergraduate, completed the Master of Business Entrepreneurship and Technology, MBET, program from the University of Waterloo, and is now working towards a PhD in higher education with a focus on entrepreneurship education from University of Toronto. Feel free to ask him about anything startup related. John will now go over his agenda. We're going to talk about the types of pitches. We're going to talk about what makes a compelling pitch, uh, the information that you want to include in your pitch presentation, and then some quick tips about presenting in general. And then I'll hand it off to uh, Hassan to talk more about the flash and um, how to actually present well and present yourself well. So jumping right into it, the types of pitches that there, you might be familiar with. The first one is competition style pitch. And primarily today, we're going to be talking about this competition style pitch uh, to prepare you for the saga pitch. Uh, for those of you who are um, going to be entering that particular pitch competition and also to prepare you for um, other pitch competitions that you might be entering as well. We're starting with the competition style pitch because I find that if you have this storyline down, you can start to manipulate some of these aspects uh, and manipulate the information that you have to stretch it or shrink it based on your need and based on the audience that you're presenting to. So for the competition style pitch, there are a couple of elements here, uh, a couple of key elements, and the length of that yellow line between the bubbles um, indicate roughly just how much time you might want to spend on that particular portion of the pitch. So if you have a three minute pitch, right? You can kind of roughly estimate the ratio of time you want to spend on the story or the ratio of time you want to spend on the problem versus the solution product market team and then close, right? So if you have a five minute pitch, of course that expands in a similar ratio. Now, with all that said, this is not a one size fits all. You have to take a look at the competition that you're in. You have to take a look at the audience that you're presenting to, who might be the judges, what are their backgrounds, and how they might be receiving the information that you have, and then adjust this accordingly. All right, so not a one size fits all. What we find, however, is that, and I'll dive into these elements uh, a little bit more, what we find is that perhaps in a competition, the people who are watching the competition, they might not have as much background information about you, about your company, and about the problem and solution um, and the product that you're actually looking to pursue. So it's worth to spend a bit of time on all of these elements. And the reason why perhaps the line between the problem and solution is the longest is because that really sets the stage. And that's what gets people caring. And some of you might wonder, hey, why is the line between product and market so short? Well, there's an explanation for that. And I'll dive into that a bit deeper. Um, but what we want to what I want to mention here before I jump into the next style pitch is the story and the close. These are really small but impactful elements. All right, I'm not going to talk about the story specifically uh, later on when we talk about the elements and the information to include, but this is your opening. This is the chance for you to really connect with your audience, really show an example of something that is happening in the real world um, to then set the stage 
to jump into the explanation and the statement of the problem that you're addressing. All right, so if we think about a Disney Pixar movie, right, think about those first, that first act. That's what's setting up the story. All right, you're building that environment at this point in time. All right, so picture um, person so-and-so, they've experienced this particular issue and this is what their life looks like. And the problem that they're facing is, right, and now you're opening it up towards the actual statement of the problem and the explanation, right? But that initial uh, story piece helps to get people empathizing with the problem that you're looking to solve, right? So very impactful yet small and quick element. The close is something that rounds out the presentation. It's supposed to be impactful. It's supposed to be the mic drop moment, right? So you've gone through all of this information. What is the main point that you're trying to drive home? What is that catchy slogan that you have that really encompasses your vision and, and the mission that you're trying to accomplish and why and that bigger uh, reason for existing as a company and as a venture, all right? That's the mic drop moment. So I'm not gonna dive too deep. I'm not gonna dive deep into uh, those two components later on. So I just wanted to talk about um, those particular aspects before we move on. So that's the competition style pitch. Those are the elements. Uh, the reason why the colors, problem and solution are the same and then product and market are the same is because we often hear about the terms problem solution fit and product market fit. All right, so there's a bit of a logic there. Those are, you know, the, the problem and the solution are highlighted in that way because to have that information complete, you're demonstrating problem solution fit. Whereas if you have product and market fit, then you would have the necessary information to fill in those buckets and those aspects of your pitch. All right, and team, it's more about confidence building about why you should be the ones taking it forward. All right, so that's why the colors are there. That's competition style pitch against uh, not a not a one size uh, fits all. You can manipulate it, but those are that's the pathway and and those are the elements that you can move around based on who you're presenting to and which competition you're presenting in and the theme uh, of the competition. Now you might hear about investor style pitches, and this is a bit different from a competition style pitch because the people you're pitching to are investors. They want to make money. So what they want to see right off the bat is the big market, right? The market opportunity is $100 trillion, right? Now you have their attention, right? Whereas in a competition, it's the story. You're trying to connect with the individual, all right? So this is where it's really key for you to really understand who the audience is and why they might be listening to you. What are they trying to get out of this conversation? Why would they be sitting there listening to you for the next two, three, five, however many minutes you might have, all right? Hit them with that right off the bat. So the investors, they want to know that this is the right market, right? That there is even a market opportunity. Then the next question that they have is, well, just because there's a market opportunity doesn't mean you're going to capture any portion of the market. So how are you going to capture the market? Who are you, right? So market, team, and then you tell the story of your company, right? What's the ecosystem that you're in, the market? And then who are you to navigate the ecosystem? And what's your vehicle, right? That's the problem, solution, pro uh, product, and business, right? And a business encompasses more of the nitty gritty than what you might uh, get to speak about in terms of the competition style pitch, right? So we're not gonna dive too deep, but there are some common elements in there. Now, elevator pitch, this is the quickest one, right? It's just get to the next conversation, just get people interested. So you see there are really only uh, four elements and of course not a one size fits all. So depending on who you're talking to, you might only get to talk about the problem or you might only get to talk about the solution. You don't actually get to the product, right? So these are things to keep in mind. And this is why it's so important for you to have your information in all of these buckets so that you know and you can react based on who you're talking to. This is the point that I'm gonna pull out and this is what's gonna resonate with my particular audience at this point in time, right? So writing your pitch isn't just for competing or pitching to investors or 
you know, preparing for meeting somebody in an elevator, right? It's really to help you to communicate the story of who you are, why you're starting your venture, and what it is that your venture is doing. And this is critical outside of, you know, these particular contexts. If you're looking to bring somebody on board uh, as a staff member, if you're looking to make a sale, your company's story is very important. Right? So having all of these elements allows you to pick and choose the information to tell a cohesive story and a logical story uh, that gets people interested in what you're working on and the problem that you're looking to solve. What do you think makes a compelling pitch? Confident delivery, a need. Yeah, I think so. I think those are good answers. I think, yes, if you don't deliver your pitch with confidence, then people are probably wondering why you're not confident about your pitch. Why are you not confident about your venture? So yeah, that does, you know, that is an element of a compelling pitch, uh, a need. Yeah, you know, if you're not solving an actual problem, then probably the audience wouldn't be very compelled, you know, while listening uh, to your pitch. Engaging the audience. Absolutely. I mean, if they if they fall asleep, then well, none of your information, however much you have of it, is not going to get through. So yeah, that's very important as well. Pressing problem people are trying to solve. Yep, absolutely. That's why people uh, would care to listen to you. Passion in delivery. Uh huh. Yep. So similar to, to confident delivery, that that passion. If you're bored about your own work, well, nobody else is going to be passionate about it either. Uh, starts out slow, builds on the idea. Very interesting uh, with, with that point there. Uh, there's the, the story uh, narrative is very interesting. And I anticipate that's kind of what you're, you're trying to get at. There's, there's a bit of a symphony you know, when it comes down to telling the story of your pitch. Um, and it's a bit of a peeling the, the layers of the onion. And that's the advantage of being in a competition style pitch because you know the time that you have is dedicated to you. Whereas in an investor pitch, if you're not giving them the information right off the bat, they're going to be jumping in with questions and your flow is going to be um, a bit changed and you're not going to be the one dictating uh, the flow of the conversation and the pace of the conversation, which if you're not accustomed to it, um, it might throw you off a little bit and it might come back and mean that, uh, or it might be perceived that you're not um, providing a confident delivery. Good story, uh huh. Profitable project persuasion, yes. Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead with my answer of what makes a compelling pitch. Everything that you said, I believe, is important. What I believe to be the essential aspect of a pitch is evidence. Without evidence, you can be so confident. Nobody's going to nobody's going to believe you right? without evidence. You can have a profitable pro profitable project. But if you don't communicate that, then, well, nobody's going to listen to you. Right. So the evidence, the actual meat and potatoes of who you are as a company. Right. That's the important part. So I've seen many entrepreneurs who focus on telling the story, to, you know, focusing on the marketing aspects, but they're not actually building their ventures. Right? So at the end of the day, it comes down to your customers, how well you know the customers and how well you're able to compile the evidence that you've gathered from customers and then communicate it, all right? So the key underpinning of any pitch is, in my opinion, evidence. And what does evidence look like? All right, evidence comes in many forms and the Leap Startup League, uh, Leap Startup League folks, you had a market research workshop. Yes. So you might have heard, you know, about market research, about secondary data, about primary data, quantitative, qualitative. This is where it comes through, right? So that means you need to do your homework. You need to actually build your venture. If you want to have a compelling pitch, you need to be building your venture because the evidence will shine through if you build your venture and you actually collect this information, right? And one of the, um, the mistakes that I see from early stage entrepreneurs who are putting their pitches together, they overly rely 
on the secondary data. And that's not compelling enough, right? To have a really compelling evidence, ideal or a compelling pitch, ideally you would have all of these points of information. You would have all of this evidence and you would slot it in a way that makes logical sense, all right? So when you have quantitative and secondary data, like big stats and market trends, that's fantastic. That's telling the audience that you have a potential opportunity here. There's a market, but that doesn't tell anyone why you're the one to succeed in the market, right? If you have qualitative secondary data in terms of expert opinions, well, that's fantastic. If you have um, a doctor saying, oh, you know, this particular um, method of treatment for this particular condition would be very helpful. Well, yeah, again, that's great, but it's not specific enough to what you're working on, right? Just because um, nine out of 10 doctors represent, or dentists rep, uh, recommend a particular type of toothpaste and your toothpaste that you're looking to sell is similar, that doesn't mean that you can succeed in the market, right? So secondary data is great. It's providing the context, right? Whether you have quantitative or qualitative, it's providing the context. You also need the primary data, right? If you just have the primary data and don't have the secondary, then people are wondering, okay, well, what's, what context are you playing in? Is there actually a market, right? So they might be confident in you and your venture, but they might not see the bigger vision, right? So it's important to have the primary and the secondary. In terms of primary uh, quantitative data, survey data, if you're surveying your customers, if you're surveying your users, that's very useful. If you already have sales or LOIs, letters of intent, uh, that's fantastic. That is quantitative primary data. You are, you are collecting the data for yourself and you're saying, okay, hey, here, here it is, right? And there's no better primary data than actually having sales. Which company would you invest in? One with a billion dollars in sales or one with $1 in sales, right? Given, you know, they're asking for the same amount, right? So that's... Uh, a very compelling piece of evidence, but that alone will not be sufficient, right? So all of this paints a picture. When you put everything together, it paints a very cohesive and complete picture. In terms of qualitative primary data, interview data, right? If you've um, done the work early to understand the problem, you might have co uh, contacted your customers and you would have gotten some good qualitative data where they're saying, yeah, this is a really compelling problem. Um, yeah, it's a very painful one. Or they're telling you, you know, in customer views, maybe they've already tried your product or your service. And they've said, yeah, this is, you know, this really solved my problem or this was so great. The customer service was so great, whatever it might be, right? So when you put all of these pieces together, now your pitch is very compelling. It's really painting a picture that, yeah, there are, there is a market there are experts saying that you're that this type of thing that you're doing is on the right track. And then you have primary data from your customers, from your, your users to say, yes, this particular venture is doing good enough for me or not doing good, doing very excellent for me, hopefully. Right. So you've got the external and you've got the internal side of the, of the argument. And in terms of where this data fits in, if my slide ever changes, it's game show time. All right, so let's take our guesses. In terms of a competition style pitch with this type of narrative, where you go through story, problem, solution, product, market, team, close, where does the big stats, where does that fit in? Okay, story, problem, 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 problem slash market, Solution, question mark. Now, where I see big stats being very effective in a pitch is market. And these big stats are, are talking to us about what the situation actually is, right? Big stats might be helpful for the problem, but not necessarily the problem that you're solving, right? So that's a hint for you know some of the uh, other types of evidence that we have here in the list. But big stats, we're talking about things like, oh, the global market is $50 billion, or there are 
a million people in Mississauga alone who, you know, face there aren't even, is the Mississauga population even a million? I don't know, I'm making stuff up, right? But these big stats tell us that there are people out there. There is something happening out there, right? And that's why it fits into the, the, the market because it leads into some other things. Talking about the market opportunity. If you talk about big stats, it, it might fit in the problem if you say, hey, look, there are uh, 10 million people who are facing this particular problem. Um, yeah, you know, it, it can fit there as well. Um, where I see it most fitting mostly is really the market. All right, so there's a bit of overlap because big stats, are you talking about problem big stats or are you talking about market big stats, right? Here, we're talking about market big stats. So not quite the, the solution um, because now the solution digs a bit deeper into what it is that you're actually doing, okay? Market trends, where's this one gonna go? Uh, market trends go in market as the name suggests. Right, so this is where you know the big stats leads into the market trends. Right, currently there are fifty billion people. There, currently, there's no fifty billion people on Earth. Currently, there's fifty million people um, who are experiencing this issue, or the market is fifty billion dollars, and it's expected to grow, right, to a hundred billion dollars in five years, or we've seen an influx of this particular type of company in the last couple of years. Um, and there's been X amount of investment dollars being poured into AI or blockchain, right? Those are market trends, right? And that fits into the market because it's telling us that there is something is going on. There's some kind of opportunity, right? And it doesn't go in the, the problem, uh, because we're talking about the market, right? If you're talking about the, the problem trend, you know, if you're, if you're uh, tackling a health issue, say, and you're saying that the, the tre problem trend is that um, more kids are vaping, right? That's not a market trend, that's a problem trend, right? So for something like that, yes, you know, you can put that in the problem, right? And so just be clear, you know, when you come across uh, a piece of information, what is it actually telling you? Is it telling you about the market where money is being exchanged? Or is it telling you about a problem, right? So that's kind of where you really have to be clear about what information you actually have in order to slot it in the most effective place. Uh, market trend does not go into product because the product is focused on you. What product are you creating, All right? And I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but I can see where your logic is coming from because um, the market trend is about, hey, this type of product might be um, increasing in popularity, right? And that is part of the market, right? That's not your product. That's the market, the dynamic of the market, all right, that's going on. So that's why it fits in the market section. Okay, expert opinions. Where would expert opinions go? Uh, where I've put expert opinions is solution. And the reason why it's in solution is because, you know, think about how you've, you might've set the stage with the problem. Or you might've said, hey, X amount of people face this. These are the causes, these are the effects. Experts say that this is the way to solve it, right? So essentially expert opinions act as perhaps an inspiration for why you have pursued the solution that you think is fitting for the problem, right? Or it acts as evidence uh, to say that your solution actually does what it's supposed to do, that it's actually feasible, right? So if you're suggesting, I'm just gonna put a bunch of buzzwords together, AI blockchain, chatbots, I don't know, that doesn't make sense, right? But let's say you're suggesting that, something that is perhaps nonsensical, um, something that just uses a bunch of buzzwords. We don't have the expert opinion to say, hey, you know, this could actually work. Uh, this is seen to, you know, solve the problem in a lab setting. Then your solution um, might not have the compelling evidence to suggest why it's unique 
or why it's actually fitting of the problem, All right? So I put expert opinions here to support the efficacy of your solution and the, uh, its fit and suitability for the problem that you've identified with the particular customers that you've identified. So I think most of you got it here. Uh, survey data, where would survey data go? So survey data goes in solution. Now, for those of you who said problem, the reason why it doesn't fit in problem is because it's quantitative, right? So it can, it can fit in problem. It's just about how you frame your survey. And I've deliberately put the survey data in solution as a reflection for how users or customers uh, have reacted to your solution. And I purposely put it in solution because there's a tendency for early stage entrepreneurs uh, to focus on the survey data at the problem stage. What we wanna get to at the problem stage is really that rich qualitative data of understanding the experience and the pain points of the customers, right? If you have that, then yes, you know, your survey data can complement it. Um, however, I deliberately put uh, survey data with solution because you can use survey data to back up how well your solution is actually doing. Where we see survey data in terms of, you know, a design thinking process might be after you've gone back to the customers to test your solution, to test your prototype, to test your MVP, right? Then that's when the survey might be most useful as they give you ratings about things. Yes, you can, you know, interview them as well, and that will be useful as well. Um, but if you're increasing the amount of customers and the amount of users and getting them to test your solution, then surveys might be a bit more efficient. Um, however, um, understanding of the problem, you're probably not going to get very deep with just a survey. All right, so that's why I didn't put it in the problem and with uh, the solution instead. All right, sales and letters of intent. Where I've put sales is market, right? This is your interaction with the market. If you have sales, if you have letters of intent, if you have kind of any kind of customer commitment, right? It's not just saying that there's a market out there. It's saying that you've captured some of the market, right? So there's no better evidence to say that, hey, we might be successful than actually being successful in converting customers, right? So the sales and the letters of intent go in the market, right? So you can start it off with, hey, the, the market trend, this is, how, this is how big the market is, and this is how the market is growing, and here's the sales that we already have, right? Here's what we've already done. Um, here are the customers that we already have. So now you're setting up the stage, the context. There's a big market. And then you're saying, and we've already gotten started in capturing the market. All right. So if you don't have sales or letters of intent, um, yes, you don't have this particular piece of evidence. All right. So what other information can you bring to the table to demonstrate that you have some commitment from your customers or potential customers? All right. So that's what sales and letters of intent we, uh, is is meant to indicate, all right, the customer commitment. How can you demonstrate customer commitment? What exactly is a letter of intent? Well, a letter of intent is um, an agreement by a customer to say that they are willing to purchase um, from you at a later date, should you meet these particular requirements from them, um, including things like the price and the feature set and you know what you might um, have promised in terms of the product that you're delivering, All right? And letters of intent are fairly common in the startup world um, because there's really, there's no money exchange um, and it's not really that legally binding, right? Because at this stage, it might be very vague and your product might change or the problem might change. So, however, it's still written commitment. Um, if you have done your, your research right into the problem, into your customer persona, into uh, developing your solution and your product, then ideally, your customers who have signed the letters of intent would follow through with that sale. And if they don't, then perhaps there's something upstream uh, that needs to be fixed, right? 
So if you have letters of intent, that is customer commitment. Uh, mostly for B2B, yes, in terms of a letter of intent. Um, how it manifests in terms of a B2C market is pre-orders right? or uh, email signups. Right? So you can have, these are letters of intent. These are customers who are intent on providing you with money later on. Right? So if you set up a pre-order, uh, maybe they don't even put in any money or maybe they put in a couple dollars or a fraction of the full cost, um, or there are systems in place as well that uh, they can put their money in escrow or they put their credit card information and they only get charged once you ship, right? So there's, uh, you know, that's, that's the letter of intent in terms of a customer commitment, all right? So if you're a B2C company and if you have pre-orders, that's fantastic. That represents the sales and LOI's uh, bucket of information that you can demonstrate customer commitment and your ability to capture uh, any portion of the market. All right, so interview data. Where I've put interview data is problem. So a bunch of you got this, and this is the differentiation that I wanted to make between survey data and interview data. Right. At the early stages, while you're trying to understand the problem, the pain points, the causes, and the effects uh, on real people, that's where you're having those interviews to have that rich qualitative uh, information, to have those conversations that really help you to understand what is going on. What are people experiencing about this particular phenomenon that they might characterize as a problem or a pain point? Right? So that's why interview data is there. Uh, I saw a point there about, you know, it might fit into solution as well. Well, absolutely. If you, you know, go back with your MVP and you gather, you know, some survey data and you talk to customers who have tested it and they give you some interview data, 100%, right? Like that fits in there as well. And the reason I put it in problem is because uh, I want to really emphasize that while you're trying to understand the problem, it's really the interviews that help you connect with the customer and to understand, empathize uh, with who they are and their experience of the phenomenon uh, that might be the actual problem or the pain point. All right, customer reviews, where would that go? It's product, all right? So um, customer reviews, this is when you've actually launched a product. And this is kind of the, the blurred line between interview data, fitting in solution and the, and the customer reviews. Now the input, Implication here is that you've actually launched and sold your product, right? It's gone off to the wild. It's got, you're selling to strangers. And now there are people who are saying, who have no connection to you, who weren't part of the early stages. They're, they've bought your product. They've, they've actually interacted with it, used it. And they're saying, wow, this is actually great, right? So that's why it fits into the product. All right. In this section, you're talking about things like, you know, what are the unique features, right? What's the secret sauce behind your product? Why can't other companies replicate? And part of that, to support that argument that you have a unique product that solves a problem and that can be sold at a reasonable price and that people are willing to buy are the customer reviews, right? That's the qualitative aspect to say, yeah, you know, like I bought this and I support it, right? So that's why customer reviews are in the product section. So, you know, you kind of have to really be clear about what information uh, you're, you have on hand. If you don't have that particular piece of information, work to get it, right? If you don't have sales or letters of intent, get that. If you don't have expert opinions, well, find an expert who might be able to give you a bit of information right? Call up, you know, connect with a researcher, connect with a faculty member and pick their brains about what their research is and how it might relate to, you know, what solution you're actually looking to solve and ask them if you can quote them, right? In your pitch or, you know, on your website, right? So um, if you don't have the, the evidence, get the evidence, simple as that. And then from there, you can manipulate it and put it in different places depending on the audience and depending on the situation in which you are pitching. All right, so I'm just gonna fly through some of these aspects um, just very quickly. What are we even talking about when we're talking about the problem, right? And in gray here, in the subtitle, uh, this is what 
essentially the audience might be thinking, right? If you're just starting to pitch, they're thinking, why should I care? Why should I even spend the next three minutes listening to you instead of daydreaming about corgis, right? Why should I care? This is the compelling problem, right? So sell them on that. It's about a greater mission. State the problem. It's as simple as that, right? It shouldn't, it shouldn't take you three sentences to explain the problem. You should really dial it down to a simple statement. And if you can't choose, if your problem is so big that you can't do that, then that means perhaps your venture needs a bit more focus and that you need to pick a particular pain point that you're starting with. Right? It doesn't mean that you know, you're, you're only doing that forever, you're only doing that, right? But what is it that you're starting with? What is it that you're immediately doing? All right, so after you set the stage with the story, let's say, hey, you know, I, I chatted with um, so-and-so, this is their problem, this is their pain point, and this represents a big problem for X amount of people, for many people. The problem is, state the problem, right? And then you want to dive into the main causes and the effects. Why does this problem exist? And if it were to continue to exist, what does that look like? What are the effects on the economy? Right? What is it costing people? What are, what are the effects on the environment, on you know, actual people's quality of life? Right? You can bring all of that in. Right? What are the main causes? What are the effects? And what's currently being done? This is often overlooked. Uh, what are, who are your competitors? And you say you have no competitors? Well, you missed out a big chunk of un explaining the problem that you have, all right? Think about direct competitors, indirect competitors. If people aren't doing anything to solve the problem, that's your competitor, right? That's currently what's being done. They're ignoring the problem. So now you have to talk to, what is it that you're doing that will get people to take action? Right, instead of ignoring the problem, right? So what is currently being done? Why is it inadequate? And now you've set the stage for you to jump in and say, well, we're solving the solution by doing X, Y, Z, All right? So you state your solution. And at this point, after you've gone through the problem, what's going on in the audience mind is, well, that's great. That's something that I should care about in terms of this big problem. But what are you doing about it? Why should I continue to listen to you instead of daydreaming about corgis solving the problem, right? So what is it about you? What are you doing? And which cause and effect are you specifically tackling? In the previous session, you might've listed, you know, three, two or three causes and effects um, each. So which one are you tackling? And be very specific here because you're not gonna be tackling all the causes and all the effects. Which one are you starting with? Be very specific. And what outcomes are you promising? So you must have heard value proposition, right? That's synonymous with outcomes promised, right? So what's your value proposition? What are you promising to your customer, to your potential customer? Not the output, not the product, but it's the outcome, right? What is that change in state? What is that, that benefit for them, that intangible benefit, right? So that's the solution. After you've done that, people are wondering, well, okay, does, does the solution actually work? How does this thing actually work? And this is where you, know, you dive into the actual product. Now we're getting a bit more uh, granular about things like the technology that you've included or um, how you're actually doing things. So if you have a service, well, what does that look like, All right? So state what the product is, the product category. It is a platform, it is a device, it is a vehicle, right? State it, what is it? And it state the unique features, it does X, Y, Z. And the reason I say state is because I've seen too many entrepreneurs fall in love with their product and take too long to explain the unique features, All right? So stay away from this. And if you notice the pathway, the product is very short. We are just simply stating a lot of these things to make people understand, okay, yeah, there's something here, right? And then afterwards they can follow up with the conversation to talk more about what makes you unique and you know, the, the actual inner workings of your product, All right? So say how the features are unique. What's that secret sauce? Maybe you have a researcher on your team who is commercializing the research and nobody else is doing this research. So you are on a bleeding edge of this particular technology, right? What enables the uniqueness? And what have the users said about the product, right? So this is going back to the customer reviews, right? If you've 
launched the product, if you sold anything, what can you bring in terms of evidence, right? What have you learned from the customers? After that, then people are thinking, well, fantastic. Uh, you can solve the problem, but is this actually a business or is this something that's going to cost too much? Right now we're looking at the vehicle for moving this solution forward and this product forward. Right? So who is the person making the purchase? This is your customer. And notice that I put person. Right? So many entrepreneurs make the mistake of saying, I'm selling to government. I'm selling to schools. I'm selling to X, Y, Z. Those aren't people. Who are the people that's actually making that purchase? Who's deciding to purchase from you? That's your key customer persona. Right. So be as specific as you possibly can. Right. So even when people say I'm selling to parents between the age of 25 to 45, that's a huge range. Right. So be very, very specific. Make sure you're not just using demographics to uh, talk about your customer. Right. Because if you only use demographics, then it shows that you're, you don't actually understand who your customer is. It's a very surface level of description. What is the price point slash the pricing model? You know, you might say I'm charging $20 or I have, you know, a, a premium version. I charge $5 for the basic. And then if you want additional features, charging $20, right? So outline that just very quickly. You don't have to explain it too, too much. How big is the market? Going back to the big stats, right? And then and the market trends. How much of the market have you captured? That's your sales. That's your letters of intent. Those are your pre-orders. And then state any notable customers or users. So if you, if one of your customers is uh, the Queen of England, and she bought what, maybe you're you're selling her gloves, and she bought your gloves, and you can see a picture of her on the news wearing your gloves, right? Like that's really cool, right? That's a notable customer, right? So that provides some kind of social proof as well, right? And in terms of the team, this is who you are, right? So who are you on, on a leadership team? What are your positions? What do you bring to the table in terms of experience and knowledge? And if you have a gap, who are your key advisors? I've seen many teams who are just a team of five engineers and people are scratching their heads. Well, how is this going to be a business? Right? If all of your engineers and you, know, you have no business background, you don't even have business advisors, right? So you really have to be clear about you know, who you are, what you need to move things forward. All right? Where are your knowledge gaps? And the key advisors are the ones who will fill in those knowledge gaps until you can bring somebody on board. All right? So after we've gone through the market, we know it's a business, we know there's a business opportunity, but why you, right? Just because there's a business opportunity, just because you've done something, how do I know that this will be ultimately successful? Right? Why are you the ones that I want to bank on and, and uh, continue to move forward with? Okay, quick tips, add or distract. If you're thinking about putting in elements, putting in information into your presentation, whether it's on the slides or whether it's in your script and what you say, is it adding or distracting? When I said daydreaming about corgis, were you thinking about corgis or were you listening to me? Right? So how does that take attention away from you? Ultimately, you want the attention on you, the speaker, not on the slides, right? So if your slides are full of text, that's distracting. People are trying to read it, right? Or they might tune out and think, you're not a good presenter. Why are you putting this text on here? I'm tuning out, right? So ask yourself, every element, everything that you put on your slides, every word that you put into your script, into your pitch, is it adding to the message or is it distracting from the message? Rule of threes. Try to condense your ideas into three buckets. Right? What are the three causes of the problem? What are the three main effects? Right? You might be tempted to put in more. Right? What are the three key features? What are the 10 key features of your product? You might have a lot. Right? Try to stick to three right? because people's memories are very limited. Right? And three makes it simple, makes it organized, and it also forces you to be organized about your ideas. All right? So try to keep to the rule of threes. Um, in what you're saying and also what you're displaying on the screen, on your slides. If you ever say that your product or your business is for everyone, that's a huge red flag. It's not for everyone. And neither is your pitch, right? This is where your research really needs to come in. Know who you're presenting to, 
know who the judges are, if you can access that information, right? If you can't, so you can take a reasonable guess based on who is um, hosting the competition, right? If you're pitching to an investor, that's easy, right? You can dig them up. They have LinkedIn. They have portfolios of companies that they've invested in, right? So be very targeted. If anybody watches Dragon's Den, you'll notice that some of them are really only speaking to one dragon. They only want one particular person and what they have to bring to the table, right? Instead of pitching an overall vague pitch, right? That's supposedly for everyone. If it's for everyone, it's not for anyone, right? So if you ever think, hey, what I'm doing here is for everyone, then you might have to scale things back a little. It might be eventually, but who are you starting with? Frame with space, all right? So whether that's on your slides, use your blank space. If it's in your script, use your pauses. Slow down when you talk. Talk faster. Talk slower, right? So you can provide that space. If you have a very important thing, important key message, right? Frame it with space. Give it time to breathe, all right? Let people actually understand what it is that you're, you're saying. And especially if you're, if you're having a dialogue, if you're asking questions, frame it with space, right? I've seen so many people who ask questions and then they, they talk and answer the question for themselves, right? So if you're asking the audience, if you're asking your investors, if you're asking your judges a particular question, let them think about it, right? Give them space. Let your messages flourish. Give it space. Emphasize key messages, right? If you have a very key message, the market is $50 billion and we've made $10 billion in sales. That's a pretty key message. You can repeat that. You can put that big on the screen. You can say that really fast. You can say that really slow, right? You can pause, right? The, the market is $50 billion and we've captured $10 billion. Like that is, that's emphasizing a key message, right? So play around with your pace, play around with your volume, um, and play around with, with silence as well to make sure that you emphasize your key messages and repetition uh, also works very well as well. Remove bullets. If you have a bullet, a list like this one, just take out the bullet. It, it, it just shows that you don't know how to make a good, good looking PowerPoint presentation slide. All right, there's no room for bullets. All right, if you need to list something, either condense it to three and put it in three buckets on your slide, or you find another way to really focus on the message that you want to say, um, remove the bullets, right? It's as simple as that. Find another way to communicate the information. And speak, don't read, right? And that means don't read off your notes either. It's a lot easier now that we're in a virtual environment um, because you can look at the screen and you have the notes right in front of you, but it's very easy to see. If you're watching somebody provide a, a speech, you can see when their eyes are moving on the screen. Right? You, you just, it's a couple centimeters away from the camera, but you can see when people are reading. Right? In the in the in-person format, it's even easier because you know you'd have a piece of paper up there. Um, but the idea here is you want to connect with your audience. You want to connect with the listener, and that comes from speaking not reading, whether it's from a physical piece of paper, whether it's reading off your screen. The key to do this is to practice. Practice, practice, practice. Know your message that you can just talk to it, right? You don't have to read. There's a couple um, phases of practice that I find, where right? you practice not enough that you forget what you have to say and you have to refer to your script, or you practice that you know your script so well but you forget if you lose your train of thought in the stressor of the in the stressors of the moment of the pitch, you lose your train of thought and you think, well, I don't know what came before and now I have to find the right script, right? That's the second level of practice. Practice to the point where you can just wing it, where you know the message by heart, where you know the key words by heart and you can just talk, right? And that goes back to having that storyline and being able to pull information depending on your audience, depending on your context, and depending on um, where it is that you're actually pitching and 
who you might be pitching to. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Our next speaker is Hassan Wadi, who is a professional speaker, entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. He has emceed events with up to 60,000 people in attendance. He speaks at schools, conferences, and events, and is a speech competition award-winning speaker. He was recently awarded the COVID Hero Award by Mayor and Council and was chosen as one of Canada's top 25 Canadian immigrants for 2021. Hassan will speak more on his story, so let's get into his portion of the storytelling pitch prep. Our part, actually, we're gonna. Well, I wanna. I wanna show you how to actually prevent, present professionally on camera, which is such an important thing. We're gonna talk about a lot of different things. You know, uh, I love what John covered. It's a lot of good stuff. He talked about, you know, the compelling, compelling pitch, the evidence, the data, the content, which is all really good. I'm gonna pretty much just tell you how to use all of that and make it interesting. Because I mean, you can be, you can have the best data, you can have the best evidence, you can have the best information, but if the person listening to you is falling asleep, it doesn't matter, right? Um, and that's what I tell my students. I tell them, you can be the smartest person in the room, but if you cannot communicate your intelligence, if you cannot let people, the people who are listening, know how smart you are by your communication, then what's the like, you, you, what's the point? They won't know. In an interview, uh, you can come in with the most experience, but if you cannot communicate your experience. What's the point? You're not going to get the job. So the communication part, the presentation part is actually really, really important. Uh, before we do that, before I actually get into all that, I want to just kind of talk about our camera here. And you guys are going to be presenting uh, uh, virtually, correct? Yes. Give me a thumbs up. Virtually. Awesome. So there are etiquettes to virtual presentation. And in fact, guys, you want to make sure you do everything perfect because every little thing counts. Okay. So, you know, um, John talked about the beginning, you know, how important that was, the first impression. I, I tell my students, first impression is sometimes last impression, right? And, and once they get an image of you, it's hard to change that. So kill that beginning, that first thing, that first, you know, what they think of you, and that's going to be what they see, right? So in regards to image, guys, in regards to presentation, if you have a camera on, try to do your best to be in the middle of the camera. I think that, that is usually best. Um, and your head should be close to the top of the screen so that you're kind of covering majority of it, right? Yeah, John was like, hey, <laughs> John, it's okay, man. You got a little gap, but it's okay. We hook you up, man. A little gap is okay, but sometimes, I mean, my students, they're like this, man. I said, brother, what is this, a mugshot, man? Come on, man. And then sometimes they're over here. I look up the guy's nose. Some guys are in the corner. You only see, like, the left eye. It's some creepy style cameras. Guys, I know you guys are better than that, but make sure you're in the middle. And at the same time, chest up so that you can see your hands. Guys, uh, body language experts have, have said, have spoken, that if the person listening to you cannot see your hands, they are less likely to trust you. It's just uh, something that we have in our minds, fight or flight, from back in the Stone Age, whatever it is, that we need to see hands, open hands especially. Especially for an interview, guys, actually they say, if your hands are under the table, the, under the table as you're speaking, the person just with the, unconsciously um, trusts you less. Get your hands above the table, show your hands. If your hands are behind your back, you know, you're just, your body just, it's just, a, you know, it's got this mechanism of fight or flight. It's always ready to defend itself. So you want to make sure that you, your hands are visible. Okay. And if you're too close, you can't see your hands. And then, you know, if you're too far, you're too far, but you want to make sure you're balanced, which is right about here. Right now you want to make sure the background is clean right now. I mean, I got some stuff in the back, but this is not my actual studio. This is my work office. I'm, I work for the city of Mississauga. I work in a gym actually guys. So I'm, I'm in a fitness center right now. Uh, yeah, the people outside lifting weights and I'm here doing a presentation. <laughs> so it's part of the job. It's okay guys. Um, and um, so background should be clean. And it doesn't have to be that it's, it's, it's absolutely nothing. It can't be your furniture. Like, like you know, Jacqueline's got a nice background. She's got her posters and whatnot. That's cool. Um, you know, uh, let's see what else. Tina's background's all right. Maybe she'll just close the door. Uh, Erica's background is okay. Mehdi's all right. He's got some clothes in the back. It's okay. No, guys, it's, as long as it's clean, it's neat, it's not distracting, should be fine, you know? Now, I still have to back to my students, but I got so many stories. Some of these guys, they got a good background. One of my students had his Spider-Man underwear in the back. I said, brother, the last thing I want to see, you know, I, see, I teach 7 to 15-year-olds, by the way. So, guys, when you're teaching 7-year-olds, you see everything. So, yeah, one of my students, I, like I guess a Spider-Man hanging on his back. I said, brother, I don't care if it's Iron Man, Hulk, uh, you know, Batman. Get the underwear out of the screen, man. And sometimes I see the, the moms and dads chasing each other, cooking in the back. And so make sure you're somewhere where it's not distracting 
you're in your room, you're not in the living room, the, the sound is clear, all that is important. The other thing when you're on camera, guys, when you're presenting on camera, when it's virtual, it's actually much harder to captivate the audience than in person. So what does that mean? That means you got to be a little bit extra, okay? People on the other side, they're going to fall asleep quick. Now, you want to make sure you get their attention. How do you get their attention? You get their attention by just being a little bit more enthusiastic, a little bit more passionate, a little bit more energetic than the usual uh, in-person you know, presentation that you would do. So just try your best to just be a, a little more, okay? This way, um, this way you're capturing the people and you're able to um, get their attention. Now, in regards to eye contact, in, in person you would look at people, right? You know, the best way to make someone feel special and feel someone engaged is you actually look in their eyes. Now, you don't look at them too long, guys, okay? If you're looking at a person like this and you're speaking, oh, yeah, and my person, hey, this business is amazing. Oh, my God, you're going to love it. And, and then that person going to be, man, this guy's creepy. He's looking at me for like five minutes, <laughs> you know? So you don't want to be a creeper, uh, I mean, in person. But on camera, you can't really be a creeper because everyone just got this screen. So what do you do? How do you give eye contact on video? Can anybody tell me how to give eye contact on video? It should be eye level. Right now, it's about eye level. Um, always look at the camera. Now, the thing is, when you look um, at the camera all the time, you can't see people. You want to see their expressions. That's why I tell you guys to turn on your cameras, because it's so important for a speaker to see the expressions of the people they're speaking to, how they're reacting, and they can adjust. So you don't want to always just look at the camera. You want to look down, look at the people a little bit, look back at the camera. And this way, you're not feeling awkward, because it is a little bit weird just looking at the camera lens. Like, I'm doing it right now, and I'm like, you know, you're just looking at, like, a black hole. You know what I mean? But once in a while, look down and look back up. But you see, it's just a different, exp when you're looking into the camera, it's like you're looking into their soul. You see, guys, doesn't it feel like it? And, and what's that? Actually, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm too far away. Let me see here. Spilet, you see, you see how it looks like when I'm zoomed in? <laughs> I'm looking right into your soul, you see? And you want to do that once in a while because that is how they will feel connected to you. That is how they will feel like you're looking at them instead of uh, speaking like this, right? Or speaking like this, right? It's, it's a total different experience. So that is camera. That's just the 101 on camera. When you guys are presenting, please make sure that these things are there, okay? Now, there's a few things that John covered. He said at the beginning, like we talked about that. And we're going to talk about storytelling um, and why that's so important. Because, you know, John talked about what makes a presentation so compelling. I'm going to talk about what makes a presentation so memorable, okay? Okay, to be remembered. Guys, I've been in so many speech competitions, so many. I've been in Toastmasters, I've been in uh, international, here, everywhere. The one thing that you need to have to win, if there is a pitch contest, is 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 memory, is that, that judge to remember you. Because what's going to happen is they're going to they're gonna listen to like 10 presentations. That's a lot. Okay, four, fifth, six, seven. You know, what's going to get you to, you know, uh, take it to the next level is whether they remember you or not. And now... Obviously, that memory has to come with substance. That's the John part, right? So the substance is, is the John part. That's really important. Because if, if you got the flash and you got the story and you got all that, but you got no substance, ain't no, that doesn't make sense, right? Your business, you're not, you're not making sales or there's no market research or there's no evidence. Um, you're just all talk. So, but, but, but when you have both, the evidence, the, the the content, the market research, all that with the story, the presentation. Now, not only do you have the substance, but you also have the presentation to get people to be interested, to get people to like you and remember you. Okay, because without the story, guys, um, they are not likely to to know you, who you are, and connect with you. Again, people do business with those they know, like, and trust. In order for them to get to know you, they have to know your story. And then when they know their story, they will connect with you, like you, and trust you. Um, now, um, he also talked about, John talked about the closing. And the closing is also so important because that is that is the last thing they remember of you, right? Think about it, guys. Anybody who's been to a restaurant before, raise your hand if you've been to a restaurant. Yes? You guys don't, oh, you guys don't eat out? Wow, these guys say, uh, entrepreneurs, of course, they got no money, right? <laughs> okay, guys, you can go. There are some cheap restaurants out there. Come on. So, yes, you go to a restaurant now, you know, and you had the amazing, such amazing dinner. The chicken was tender. It was it was hot. It was spicy. Whatever it is. I don't know what kind of chicken you guys like, but the, the chicken was good. And then you order the dessert, and the dessert is so bad. It's 
It's it's uh, you know the worst taste you've ever tasted. Now, what's the last thing that you, that's gonna be in your mouth? What's the last taste that you're gonna when you walk out of that restaurant? Is it the the nice chicken or is it the dessert? Which one? Just unmute and yell it out. Dessert. The dessert, guys. The dessert. So just remember this in your presentation. You can give a killer presentation, a killer. But if your 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 ending is not strong, that's the last thing they remember. Okay, finish strong. Start strong to get the first impression. Finish strong so that you're remembered. Okay, guys, remember that. Remember that. So those two parts, as intro and close, I always say, like if you're gonna if you're gonna really work on what you're gonna say, those are the two parts. In the middle, you can kind of freestyle it. But the, the intro and the close is is key. Intro is is your story. It's it's what you get them hooked with. They say, guys, that the first six seconds of, of a presentation or a speech. You have six seconds. The first six seconds is when your audience decides on whether they want to continue listening to you or not listen to you, right? We have short attention span. So what are you going to do in your first six seconds? What are you going to do in your first part of your speech? Hello, my name is Hassan Wadi. I like to take long walks on the beach, and I and I came from here. No, no, go into your you go into your story. Get right into who you are. Most of the time, people come and reintroduce themselves. You don't need to do that because somebody's already introduced you. They've introduced you. They've introduced what you're gonna do. And you get right into it. Um, the best, the best way to start a presentation, a speech, I would say, is always a story, right? And then, and then you go from captivating them, connecting with them to your meat and your content, and your evidence, and and all the stuff that John talked about, um, so that now you're showing that you know you're you're credible. You're credible, okay? Um, what I'll do now is I will share my screen. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go briefly over, uh, the importance of storytelling guys, why, why it's so important, not just for your pitch, but for your brand. Okay. When you actually, everyone here, I want to hear this pitching as an entrepreneur, as a, as a business owner, and you're going to, you, you want to grow, you want to succeed, you want to, uh, you want to do business. And guys, this is a key component, key, key, key component to succeeding. I'll tell you that right now. Um, and, and in fact, it's a key component to selling. Selling is kind of like show right you have to be able to speak you have to be able to present you have to be able to persuade um and when you're pitching you're selling right i work with the charity guys i work with the hti so i'm their brand ambassador and spokesperson i do all their videos i travel i just came from bc british columbia anybody heard what's happening in bc anybody heard what's happening the mudslides yeah the floods and the mudslides so i went down there actually to capture the story and to distribute uh food and goods i came back yesterday and in, when it comes to fundraising, when it comes to raising money with a charity, the number one thing to get people to donate is, what is it, guys? Emotional oh, story. Yeah, it's a story, emotional story. That, get, that gets the heart. Now, we can tell them millions of people are starving, this, that. That's the facts, right? And it's important. That's really important. But when coupled with a story, when coupled with a story, you get people by the heart. And that's what the story is for. You get people by the heart and you give them the facts. And then you have their donation, okay? Really, 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 really important. So think about that. Think about how are you um, telling your story? Um, yes, I see in the chat for your business, right? So we went there. We did distribution. I do videos. We have a story of a family that's in trouble. We share that story. People donate. We find another family, whether it's an orphan, a single mom, whatever it is. Um, that's what we do. In a few days, I'll be traveling to Turkey, Lebanon, and Syria. I'll be doing the same thing. We're going to be meeting orphans there, single mothers who are struggling, uh, visiting different homes, and then obviously fundraising. Uh, we'll be going with some influencers, and they'll be doing the exact same thing, and they will be raising money coming back. But again, it's all connected, guys, because at the end of the day, you're convincing. You're convincing someone, right? Um, they say sto uh, facts tell, stories sell. So it doesn't mean one's better than the other, guys, right? Facts tell. They tell you what's happening. But the story is the one that sells. So facts tell, stories sell. And a fact tied to a story is 30 times more memorable than a fact alone. Remember that. Because, you know, we've all been in high school. People come up with their Bristol board and they're telling their cancer does this, this, this. And people are falling asleep. Um, but you tell a story of a victim, with a family member who had cancer. Or maybe your, your presentations on smoking. And you're talking about how bad smoking is. Eventually, people will get bored of that because, yeah, we all know that. But if you tell them a story of maybe a family member who was affected by smoking, and then you give them the facts, you've already connected them, you want them over through the story, 
and then and then they want to listen to the facts you know what i mean they, they they're engaged right so keep that in mind i gotta go through all my slides because i covered a lot of it already but um you might be wondering what's your story i i'll tell you my story i started off as a personal trainer i started off as a personal trainer and um i was just a trainer that's all i knew i could do and i was training teaching classes did really good eventually for the city of Misaga, eventually um i got promoted uh, to a supervisor role i managed the gym i managed my 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 uh, instructors and personal trainers and as i moved up in in the leadership role i realized the importance of speaking and communicating to become a leader I was shy in meetings, I wouldn't speak up. I had to do presentations, PowerPoint presentations, and and um, I just didn't do too well. I, I didn't put my hand up, I was shying away and whatnot. And there was one time where my boss asked me to cover for a presentation um, for somebody else. And it wasn't my job, I was, you know, I, I didn't want to do it, but you know, you know, you want to impress your boss, right? You got to say yes, right? You can't say no, guys, that's what I mean. You don't have a boss, right? That's right, I remember, you guys are entrepreneurs, you don't have bosses, amazing, guys. You don't have to worry about that. But anyways, she asked me to do a presentation and, and I said, yes. And I totally blew it. It was, a, I did a terrible job. And then because of that, I said, I never want to go through that again. So I joined Toastmasters. Anybody know what Toastmasters is? Raise your hand if you know what Toastmasters is. Raise your hand, let's see. Okay, some, some people know. Toastmasters is an international public speaking organization that helps people improve their public speaking skills. Really, really, really important uh, organization. I joined it. And I said, I'm gonna work on my communication skills. I did it for four years. As I improved my communication skills, I realized, wow, you know, I, I started seeing opportunities come my way in my job, in my city job and outside of my job. One of them was the charity job, right? I started getting this opportunity, that opportunity. I started joining contests. And this was one of the Toastmaster contests. I'm holding the awards. This is my first one actually. And I never wanted to join contests because it was scary. Actually, before this pitch prep happened, guys, we were saying, they were telling, I remember I was part of the organizing committee and they were worried. They said, well, some people are not comfortable pitching and maybe we shouldn't do a pitch contest because they're uncomfortable and, you know. And I said, guys, so what? Put them to the competition. Let them get uncomfortable. Even if they're scared, that's a good thing. Because what happened is, guys, you have to be able to master this if you're a business owner. You cannot shy away from being a salesperson or a person that presents. You cannot do it. You have to be good at this part. You have to improve and, and you have to work on it. And so the fact that you're doing this, this pitch, prep, whether you win or don't, I'll tell you that right now, the competition or whatever it is, you're going to grow because a big part of my growth was competitions. I did one, I did another one, another one, another one, and just the pressure and having to prepare for it. So everyone here, just know this, that pressure, you're not going to get anywhere else. And that pressure is going to help build you and make you much stronger, uh, much smarter, much more prepared and a better communicator, okay? So I started joining contests and that, that went great. From the contest, you know, and becoming a better speaker, the city started giving me more opportunities. This was here, me with the mayor and the city manager, and we were doing, it was a United Way challenge, and I was the MC here. And I started getting opportunities, right? As I realized the import, the, the effect that I had through of improving my public speaking skill, I said, hey, you know, what if I can teach this to others? What if I can teach this to others? And that's when I started my own business. Yes, I'm an entrepreneur too, guys. You guys think you're the only entrepreneurs. No, I'm with you. I'm double right now. I'm double. I'm working for the city of Saga. I'm also, I have my own business. And so I started my own academy, Youth Speaker Academy. These are my students. This was their graduation. We had about 500 students graduate at that day. Um, they're holding certificates. And I said, there's a problem here. A lot of people have skills, but they're not able to communicate the skills. So again, back to John, what he said, the problem. And I was fixing a problem. Kids went to school, they did their thing, but they never really worked on their communication and public speaking skills. So I created a program where parents can enroll their kids and do that. And so that was a solution. My program was a solution. Um, since then, I've had more than a thousand students, like I said, that have coached and mentored. YMCA is one of my big clients. We coach all their students as well. Um, and then obviously the charity job came in. Um, I became the, the Sultan of Turkey. Actually, no, I'm just joking, guys. This was just a joke. I just put that picture up. This was actually, I was in Turkey, guys. And you know what? You pay like 10 bucks or something. You put on the outfit and take a picture. <laughs> One day I'll become the king. Don't worry. <laughs> but this was just a joke, okay, guys? It's not part of the story. Anyways, um, but you see now, guys, um, that was my story as as a business owner for You Speaker Academy. And that was, that was the extended because I have time. For you guys, you got to shorten it. But now, now you see what I went through. When you know that I went through the struggle 
and I overcame it, that my story is very relatable, and now I'm teaching others, my credibility to you is much greater. You say, wow, you know, like, this guy would be the perfect teacher for my son to teach him public speaking or teach her public speaking. You know, he went through the whole challenge. He went through the journey. They connect with my journey. And in fact, everyone connects because everyone's scared of public speaking. Actually, raise your hand if, you're, if, if, you're, if you get nervous when it comes to public speaking. Raise your hand uh, if it's something that makes you nervous. Yeah. Um, brand storytelling is using a narrative to connect your brand to customers. It is a powerful way to build lasting connections with your audience. Compelling stories engage consumers, elicit emotion, and foster loyalty, forging a meaningful relationship that goes far beyond product and service. Guys, here's something. You know, I teach uh, part of my academy, when I teach the kids, I teach them persuasion. And persuasion has two aspects. The reasoning. mind, what was that, Zoo? What was that, Zoo? Uh, reasoning. Reasoning, okay, good, reasoning. Now the reasoning happens, that kind of, that's really, they're probably the closest to the mind. The mind, which is facts, stats, evidence, like John mentioned, right? That's why it's perfect. Me and John are like tag team, man, because he really covers that part, right? The mind, the mind, the mind, the fact, the data, all that stuff. And then what's the second one? Now you guys should know. Jacqueline put in emotion. Emotion, which is? Heart. Uh, the heart, yes, the heart, the heart, right? The mind and the heart. People convince through the mind and the heart. Kids do this best. Kids do this best, you know? Mom. How could you do this to me? All my friends have an Xbox. I'm the only one still with a Nintendo. Please, you know, I'm getting bullied in class. Nobody likes me. Nobody wants to be my friend. Please buy me the Xbox. And then mom's, oh man, I feel bad for my son. You know, he's left out. I got to buy him the Xbox. That is persuasion through the what? Through the, through the heart, right? Through the heart. And then, and then John comes in. Dad, did you know that the Xbox is 10 times more powerful than the PlayStation? That's right, 10 times. Did you know that the graphics two times more powerful than Nintendo? That's right, Dad. That's why we should invest in the Xbox. And if we get the Xbox, I believe that our return is going to be multiplied. Because when I play the Xbox, my my you know, uh, my reaction time is going to improve three times based on research. Right? So now John Lamb is convincing his dad through the mind. I'm convincing my mom through the heart. Now, you can combine both of them. You got the perfect formula. And now the story... Story is more the heart, okay, guys? It's more the heart, right? So include the heart with your mind. You got the perfect format for success, okay? Here we go. In storytelling, guys, storytelling has been around for so long. Visual and oral story, Stone Ages, 30,000 BC. They used to tell stories, sit around, you know, rocks and tell stories to each other. They used to draw. You know, if you go to the pyramids, all, all the stories in the pyramids, those are all stories, right? That's how they communicate. Storytelling has been a way of communication for so long. Written storytelling, of course. We got um, we got newspapers, um, you know, magazines, uh, you know, photographs, all these things, and digital storytelling. That's now the future, which is social media. Right? We tell our stories through our content, right? So just just to understand uh, again the importance of it. Eighty percent of customers want to develop more meaningful relationships with brands, but they cannot connect with you without your story, right? Same thing when you're pitching. You want them to connect with you, so you want to you want to share a piece of yourself. Without that, they, that connection cannot happen. Okay, um, sixty percent, sixty-six percent say that you know they share their information, but the brand is not sharing theirs, right? And fifty-five percent say they would, who people consumers love the brand story are willing to make a purchase based on the story. In fact, I saw um, data uh, research showing that um, you can charge more for a product. And get people to buy that product with a with a story compared to a product with no story. So imagine it allows you to even charge more. Okay, so again, related to your pitch and your message. And remember, if a product is able to charge more with a story, how how is your pitch strengthened with your story as well? Remember that. Why brand storytelling is important. Consumers are hungry for brands that allow them to develop real understanding and loyalty. But to do that, you as a brand must share enough to give customers an appreciation of your journey. Of your journey. I just told you guys my journey, right? You're able to appreciate it. And you're, a bit, you're able to appreciate my service 10 times more now because you know I've been through it, right? So, again, I ask you, what is your story? Stories build trust. People do business with those they know, like, and trust, like I told you guys, right? So we'll get people to know you through your story so that they can like you and trust you. And not just with your business, but when you meet people. Share your story. When you meet with people, you want people to like you. Don't be so, so, so private. 
get share a piece of yourself where you came from what you know why are you here who are you these are the things that you want to um share okay in person and in your pitch okay we're kind of hitting both we talked about this as well they're memorable 30 times more memorable when you when you tie a story to your to your to your uh, fact uh two minutes is the average time uh, a customer will spend viewing your content on on your website whatever it is it's quick right and 53 53 percent from those two minutes uh only 53 percent content is consumed sorry yeah when they look at those two minutes they miss most of it right so to get really grab someone's attention make sure you share your story right Papa John's, Papa John's. This was a really good one. Um, I was, uh, I was actually, um, I was in a Papa John's eating pizza, guys. And I was actually, I had a, a storytelling uh, presentation for for an organization. Like a few days later, I was putting it together. It was a total coincidence. I was eating. I looked to my right, and I see um, like a poster that they had, you know, a frame with a picture like this that you see right now. It's just the Mustang. And um, a Mustang and Papa John's behind the Mustang, and then the story of of how Papa John started. And 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 I read it, and it talked about how Papa John's, when he wanted to to open up the pizza shop, he sold his favorite yellow Mustang. You know, it was a 19 something, 1971 Camaro, right? Camaro, not a Mustang. Sorry, I'm mixing up cars, guys. You see here, Camaro, right? He he sold it to open up his pizza shop. Um, and that's how bad he wanted to open the pizza shop. And then later, years later, when that pizza shop became multi-million dollar business, what did he do? He bought that car back. He got ripped off, but you know what? He's a millionaire. Who cares? 270000 right? 270000 he paid for his new car. That guy got him good. <laughs> that guy got him good. But hey, it didn't matter to him because the story was so important. That car had so much meaning. He bought it back. And now if you see Papa John's, when they have their stands, they have this Mustang everywhere. Why? Because the story is connected. For me, when I was eating that pizza, it was no longer just a pizza. It was a pizza with a personality. It was a pizza with character. It was a pizza with identity. So remember that, guys. Your business, what what gives your business identity, personality, character? It's you and your story, right? You as a person. You are your brand, right? And you are your your story is also connected to that. So make sure to not lose out on that opportunity, right? What is your story? Um, I was buying nail polish uh, for my wife, and uh, they had the little postcard in the nail polish, our love story. And it talks about how he was studying uh, medicine. He had no money. You know, anybody studying medicine has got no money, right? It's so expensive. And she wanted to buy this really expensive nail polish. He couldn't buy it for her. But he's in medicine. I guess, you know, he knew this stuff. So he went, he made his own nail polish, and he gave it to her on a Tuesday. And then that that's how his business started, right? And, it, and then so he called it Tuesday in Love. So it's even connected to um the name of his business and i found this so amazing and you know that's a beautiful and he with every purchase he puts this postcard with the story right it gets you to appreciate the journey right so i, I told i already told you my story you don't have to worry about that um now your question is okay i got a story uh, what, what do i do how do i tell my story what do i share in my story it's simple keep it simple guys it's like you know you're telling a your friend don't think it has got to be like a like a thesis statement some people come up and they got the biggest world's words in the world to impress don't do that please in your pitch please keep it simple as if you are talking to a friend um presentation is about conversation not you're not here to report you're here to conversate you're talking to your audience you're you're connecting with them as if you are connecting with your friend think of think of your pitching to your friend you're telling your friend why your business is so amazing and why they need to invest right how would you do it you're not going to go away with these big words and in conclusion, you know, you know, moreover, these words you're not gonna use, guys, in a in a proper conversation, right? You're not. So don't use them in a presentation because people think a lot of people think, oh, speech presentation has got to be so formal. No, it's got to be relatable. You got to be able to relate with your people, and that for that to happen, keep it casual, keep it normal, right? So who you are, talk about that. How did your company come to exist? What is your company vision, mission, values, all that stuff? Who you do it for? You know, who do you help, right? Talk about that. Who do you help? For me, it's the, it's the youth. It's the future. I want to see them grow up and and you know be able to excel in any field that they do because communication is required in any field. So I want them to become leaders in their fields, and and, and that's why I'm doing right. So why are you doing it? What, what are you doing? Right? Think about that. Why are you doing? It? We talked about that. Where are you headed? The future as well. You make sure you talk about that. All this stuff is personal. It's the heart, right? Um, it, it 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 does get a little bit of the the brain. 
or the John's part as well is here, right? Uh, where you are headed, you know, they, they want to hear that. They want to hear that you have a future, you have a vision, right? Um, and then and then just think about what is, what's your story? This is the question that I ask you guys now is, what is your story? You know, do you have a story? Is it a good story? What can you do to spice up your story a little bit while keeping it sincere, right? Um, and obviously you don't want to make it too long. John gave you that outline, right? Uh, you know, of, of everything that you got to do and where storytelling has to be. Now, um, you have to make sure it's strategic so that it's not long where you don't get the other stuff. And it's not too short where you don't give the feeling, right? Which is really, really important. Um, let me share one thing here. Um, that was really good. So now, now that you kind of have an idea on storytelling and why it's important, I do want to give you some quick presentation tips because you guys have to present at the end of the day. You want to make sure that you have good presentation skills. And it's not easy because we're not all professionals in this. And this is something that um, I put together after you know competing multiple times. And when you compete and you speak and all that, you really have to be on top of your game, right? have to be the best of the best because if you're not someone will beat you right and let me just get it here but i have to move this start and end strong we talked about this one okay start and end strong first and last impression to give eye contact right to the camera right but not all the time go up and down practice your speech before you present john covered this one practice 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 like he said uh, but don't sound scripted sometimes you practice so much where you're like a robot you memorize every single word don't do that don't over practice, don't under practice. Leave some for, you know, like, you know, for freestyling, right? You got to freestyle a little bit, guys. Make it real, make it personal, because remember, people connect with you when it's personal. Get vulnerable. If you've had some struggles in your business, if you had some something that you want to share, you know, where you, it's not about, you know, it's not about your weakness, it's about how you overcame your weakness. That's what they look for. In an interview, when they ask you, what's your biggest weakness? You know, it's the worst when you come up, my biggest weakness is I work too hard. I work so hard that, you know, I end up spending all day working hard. And I don't have time for myself or for my family. And I wish I didn't have this weakness. I just, you know, when I get this job, my, my fear is that I work too hard in this job. Guys, no, don't do that because they're going to be like, man, this guy is giving me a bull. You know, give a real weakness and then tell us how you overcame that weakness, right? That's It's about how you overcame, not about the actual weakness. So get vulnerable with your business too. It's not about your mistakes, it's about how you overcame your mistakes. Um, have vocal variety. Don't speak with the same tone the whole way through. Please guys, please. Because if you do, if you do, there will be a lot of people that will fall asleep. And if they fall asleep, you will not win. And it's gonna be hard for you because you're not gonna be able to really, the audience energy is not gonna be there. So change your voice go up and then go down but don't go like that I mean, it's not a drama show guys but you know you get me <laughs> all right and, whoa, whoa. It's, it's not a drama so relax don't overdo it man it's, but it's drama class you know back in the days those were good days but um uh, have vocal variety use names when you're referring to people use their names okay it allows the audience to connect paint the picture with your words get your audience to imagine if you're talking about your struggle get them to imagine your struggle right get them to to see it get them to feel it get them to smell it right get them to feel as if they were in your shoes right they do this if you watch shark tanks and dragon den sharks tank and dragon's den when they come up you know a lot of times when they're about to lose they're about to lose they start crying oh my god the struggle Some, guys i've seen it i've seen it happen with the they start crying and they get a deal i said i can't believe it you know so it works it works but uh uh, get really people to feel it. Right? I mean, you know, don't cry next week or whatever your presentation is. Please don't do that. But, but I mean, if you do it sincere, it's fine. You could do it. But I'm uh, just again trying to give you an idea. Paint a picture with your words. Take a few seconds. This one, so many people do this, this incorrectly, including my students. They do this a lot. Um, they're so nervous. This one, he started, you know, it's their turn. And, oh, no, 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 no. Relax, relax. There's confidence in just being subtle and calm, right? It's your turn. They clap for you. Yes. Next up is John Lamb, the startup man. And John Lamb comes up and he's ready. John, just, just chill out. Just stay there. Smile, right? Wait until the audience settles down and then get started. Don't be so Relax. Calm down. You, you, you have to control the audience. You're the boss. When you speak, you're the boss. Um, number 10, don't lecture the audience. 
If you start with your story first, they want to listen to your message lesson after. It's like we tell you, don't smoke. Smoking is bad. Smoking is bad. Smoking is going to kill you. The people are going to be like, ah, I'm tired of hearing this. I hear this all the time. Lecture, 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 lecture. But if you tell them a story of, of how your uncle got affected by smoking and maybe passed away, and then why smoking is bad, they're more likely to listen to you. So when you're your pitch as well, when you start with your story and then you give your facts, they're more likely to listen to you. Let's see what else we got. You're almost done. Stay within time limit. This is number one. In a contest, you will lose if you go above time limit. For us, it was 30 seconds over, 30 seconds under. I'm not sure what you guys have here, but make sure to follow it. Number 12, keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate. I've been so many to pitch contests, so many. And the guy goes up, man. And I would do that. At the end of the presentation, I said, what do you do, brother? I don't know what you do. What's your business? I have no idea. Because just too much information. Too much information. Sometimes simplicity is key. So please, if they give you five minutes and you want to just squeeze everything in that five you don't have to. Sometimes a three-minute person is going to beat the five-minute person. Right, number 13, question for you. If you stop midway in your speech, will they want to hear more? Will they say, man, you got to continue? You please continue. Oh, no, what's going to happen next? Will they, that's a question for you. Now, question for all of you. When you watch your favorite show, what, when you finish one episode and you just, you got to go to sleep, you got to work tomorrow, but you're like, you know what? I gotta watch the second episode, or maybe the first five minutes of the second episode. I just want to know what happens next. What what um what makes you what makes you want to continue that show? How can you do that for your speech? How can you do that for your presentation? Yeah, if you stop right there and then the the, the judge is like, no, no, you gotta keep going. We gotta know what happens next, right? So that's a question you gotta ask yourself. Okay, it's a really really important question, but it's a it's a question that will make or break your presentation. Um, number 12, 14. Uh, don't run off camera after you finish your speech. My students do this all the time. They turn off their camera, turn off their, their mic as soon as they're done. Don't do that. Finish presenting, stand still, let them clap. Let them clap, let them greet, you know, be happy, smile. Yes, take the applause. And then and then they'll move on. Uh, number 15, make sure to pause. Sometimes a pause is the best thing you can do to capture people's curiosity and attention. Uh, it doesn't have to be that long, but pause once in a while, right? Um, between sentences, between paragraphs, between, you know, between your, your, your story and your facts or whatever it is, make sure you pause. Be 16, 16, be aware of your body language, which is your hands right here, like I mentioned. Make sure your hands, you don't want to be moving like this, guys, because people are going to be, whoa, whoa, they're going to lose track. So don't go everywhere, but use your hands, you know? Um, Donald Trump does a great, I, I know guys, listen, I know Donald Trump, but he does a great job in using his hands. Just watch him speak. He's always, tick, 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 tick. he has his hands here, hands here. He, he can persuade. Hey, he might, maybe he's not talking facts. Maybe he's not, but he can persuade. He can, he can make you believe that your hair is orange and is black. The guy's good. And people believe that. So, so, so just, and he does something really well. Just watch. He's always using his hands like this, like, wow, big, amazing. You know, you see him when he's talking about something big, his hand go like that. He's just really good at it. Obama does the same thing. Very, very good. And with the pauses, if you listen to Obama, he does it a lot. He pauses, right? And he gets to the next sentence and he pauses, right? I'm not pausing a lot in this in this in the presentation, but because I got no time, right? We we gotta move, and I don't want to go too long because our, our goal is to finish eight ten, hopefully. Last is how fun audience wants you to succeed. Remember this always, because when we go in, we always think we're gonna fail, we're gonna mess up, we're gonna screw up. That's our negative thinking. Don't don't let that affect you. Actually, before I do any presentation, here's something you guys can do. I always talk to myself. I say, Sam, you are the man. If anybody can do it, you can. Go out there, kill it. You've done this before. You presented. You, you know you're gonna do an amazing job. I just I just talk good to myself for like a good five minutes. I'm not joking, guys. You could you gotta do that. You gotta self talk. You have to be your own cheerleader. If you're not your own cheerleader, who's gonna be your cheerleader, right? If you don't believe in yourself, who's gonna believe in you? You gotta believe in yourself first. So remember to do that self talk before you present. Get your posture up. When you're when you're when you're like this, you slouch. You're you're gonna be less confident, 100%. Back to the fact, John Lamb, John Lamb loves facts. Facts show, facts show, stats show, guys, that if your posture is bad, your confidence will be low. How you walk also, you know. So before you present, do the Superman pose. That that's what they say. Chest up. Guarantee within 30 seconds a minute you're gonna feel better. 
find ways to get your energy up before a presentation so that when you speak, the energy actually comes out. Okay? Uh, remember to start strong. Remember to end strong. Good impression, first impression. End strong so that you last with a memory. Um, give your facts, as John said, your data, your backup on why you're amazing. Because you're going to talk about that. You're going to, again, the flash is important, but flash without substance is, is, is not good, right? It's not credible. So make sure you have both. Go in there. Don't feel, you know, uh, don't let, allow yourself to talk yourself down. Uh, talk, have your self talk. Um, prepare beforehand, practice. Um, whoever you're pitching to, make sure you know what they want first. Make sure that you know what they want so that you can sell what you're giving whether it's your business, whether it's your pitch, that's the best sale. That's the best sale is when you ask questions and then you're able to deliver based on those questions, okay?